Amen. Well, I don't know about you guys, but that was a special morning of worship. I just feel the weight in the room, if you feel that too. And it just makes me so grateful that we have a Savior King in Jesus Christ. And it is so good to be gathered as the saints to worship that King, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. My name is Justin, and I have the privilege of serving as a pastor here at CL Benny. Uh, This morning, if you've been tracking with us, you know we've been going through a Holy Spirit sermon series. And the purpose of the series is really not to just have some intellectual, big head academics about the Bible, but it's actually meant to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We are here to teach that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, that he is our helper here on earth while Jesus and the Father are in heaven. And he is so gracious and kind to give us spiritual abilities, which we've been talking for the last few weeks, to really build up one another in faith and in love. And that is what we're here to do. Why are we going through this series? Why are we going to take this morning to look at the specific spiritual ability of speaking in tongues One Sunday to talk about this gift so that we might be equipped to build one another up in faith and in love. Amen? Amen. 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 Now I know there might be some hesitation in the room. There might be a lot of different responses when I say the phrase speaking in tongues. There may be some of you who have had backgrounds where there's a little bit of hesitation in your heart right now. There may be a lot of you with beautiful experiences where there's anticipation in your hearts right now. Wherever you are on this spectrum, I want to encourage us. Can we just take a deep breath together? (sighs) We have God's word and we have God's spirit to help us navigate, to bring clarity and to demystify anything that we have bringing in this morning. So let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its infallibility. I thank you for its truth that crushes lies and removes confusion. I thank you, God, that you are not a God of confusion, but a God of clarity. And I thank you for your word that brings clarity where confusion may be in our hearts or in our minds. Spirit of God, I just pray right now that you would illuminate your word. Help us as you are the helper. And would you equip us to have a hunger, an earnest desire and pursuit of you and your gifts that you are so gracious to give so that we might be built up in faith and in love to make much of Jesus. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. Well, this morning, like I said, we're going to be looking at the spiritual ability of speaking in tongues and interpretations. Three questions I want to answer this morning are first, what is speaking in tongues and interpretations? The second, what is the purpose of speaking in tongues and interpretations? And lastly, how are we to earnestly pursue and practice speaking in tongues with interpretations? So let's dive into the first question. What is speaking in tongues and interpretations? If you have a Bible, I would invite you. We also have guys in the back. We have both Johns coming down the aisles. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. This is our gift to you from C.L. Benny. If you do have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And we'll be in verse 1 through 6. A little context here. This is going to be the first biblical recording ever seen and witnessed by the bride of Christ of speaking in tongues. Here we are, Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own Language. So here we see the first ever recorded God, the Spirit, coming down on the people of God and allowing them to have the ability to speak in tongues. Now, this is the ESV translation of speaking in tongues. We might go with Roy's favorite, the NLT, New Living. And this is helpful because what it does is it puts language a little more common. And it says, instead of speaking in tongues, speaking in languages. And we're going to use that translation because it's helpful, and that's exactly what it is. We see from this example that they were earthly languages that every man under their own nation and language could understand. So we're going to give a clean definition. What is speaking in tongues? It is simply the God-given spiritual ability to speak earthly languages that we don't understand. And therefore, we need an interpretation. 
This may sound overwhelming. This may sound a little wild on paper. But can I just remind us that this is not overwhelming to God? That speaking in languages, first of all, is something that is God-given. That there is no language on earth that God himself did not create graciously for our benefit. That God doesn't need languages, but has graciously gifted us so that we could communicate with him. That we could understand him. That we could talk with him. We could communicate with one another. These are all God-given things that God designed by giving us language in the first place. So we shouldn't be surprised if God allows us to speak in another language. Because although they are a different language and we need an interpretation, God don't need no interpretation. He created the language. And therefore, we, not being God, need an interpretation. This is an earthly language that we need interpretations for, God-given. And we should not be overwhelmed because these are all given and designed by God anyway. One way to know for certain that the Bible is definitely God-breathed is the fact that some 2,000 years ago, they were having the same human problems that we were. And as we look at the response to this wild scene of a rush of wind and as a flaming tongues of fire are resting on these people, there was a little bit different responses. And in the same way, we have that today in the church. And let's look at the response in Acts 2, pick up in verse 11, as we look at the different responses to this pretty amazing scene. It says, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues and mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new Wine. So we see three different responses to this amazing God-given scene. We see that people were amazed, they were perplexed, and some mocked. Now friends, as we check our own hearts this morning, and, and you might try to categorize which one are you this morning, we should all be amazed and even I would say perplexed by the higher ways of our God that we just don't understand fully, right? Deuteronomy tells us that. But friends, I plead with us that we would never, never, never be a people who mock God and the things of God or the people who have experienced God in the ways that he has so graciously chosen. So friends, would we stand amazed? Would we even stand perplexed when it comes to speaking in languages? But friends, would we never mock? Would we never mock one another if you have this gift? Friends, we just have to understand that God is a God whose ways are so much higher than ours. He does whatever he pleases, and we should be astounded that one of the things that pleases him is to actually graciously manifest himself through the Holy Spirit. That he would show himself and manifest his love to us through the spiritual ability of languages and interpretations. This should amaze us. And remember that all of it's undeserved. It is a God-given, gracious gift for God to show us how much he loves us. Why on earth would we ever mock such a gift? And I understand that maybe some of you have experienced in the past those who have maybe misused this beautiful gift, maybe even abused this beautiful gift. But friends, I am asking us, pleading with us, exhorting us not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Why would we ever look at glimpses of sinful human hearts and let that overshadow and scribble out the beauty of God's sinless heart? Friends, I'm inviting us, just like Jesus invited Peter when he was walking on the waters, don't look at the winds and the waves when it comes to speaking in tongues and interpretations. As you take steps of faith together as a church, would we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus? And would we look away from the winds and the waves of those who are misusing and abusing these beautiful God-given gifts and remember that they're all meant to point us to Jesus. Amen? Let's keep our eyes on the gift giver and not the one with the gift. And friends, our motivation through all of this, just like every spiritual ability, is meant to be used in love. To build one another up. To be expressed in faith. To increase someone else's faith. And therefore, this motivation of love, this love should outweigh our fear of comfort and our preference of comfort. Our fear of God should outweigh our fear of man when it comes to speaking in tongues. Amen? 
And this leads us to the second question I want to answer. What is the purpose of all this? What is the purpose of being able to speak in another language we don't understand and need an interpretation? Well, let's go ahead. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. We'll take a look in verse 4 and 5. Paul speaking, writing to the church of Corinth, he says, The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So again, we remember the purpose in all of this, in all spiritual gifts, and particularly, specifically speaking in tongues, is for the building up of the church. We know that this is actually a unique gift when it comes to speaking in tongues because while all other gifts are meant to build up someone else, speaking in languages can actually build up the person speaking. This is a unique gift. And yet at the same time, when there is an interpretation... It can be spoken to build someone else up. So it's a unique gift. When there's no interpretation, it can build up the speaker. When there is an interpretation, it can build up someone else. It's similar to prophecy, prophecy, which Glenn spoke on a few weeks ago. And I will actually share an example here later of my own experience with this. Um, But let's go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians. We'll stay in 14 and jump ahead to verse 13 and 16. He says, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, but my my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving? So we see that God is so gracious to not only give us the overall purpose of all spiritual gifts, which is to build up the church in love, but he is even so kind to give us his word to categorize the different ways of what speaking in tongues does. How does it build up the church? Well, there are three categories we get from this passage. The first is prayer, there's praise, and there's thanksgiving. So there's an automatic test that if you've ever spoken in a language or you want to, that it will be categorized in one of those three things. And if it's not, it's not of the Lord. If it's not praying to God, praising God, or giving thanks to God, you can easily test the Spirit and say, that's not of Him. That's not Him. And that's as simple as it is. All of this is meant to build up the church. We should be a praying church. We should be a praising church. We should be a church giving thanks. And if it so happens to be by a, in another language, praise God. Okay. Ephesians 4, 11 through 14, if we jump there, what is the purpose of being built up? What is our burden as pastors as we have gone through and toiled through this sermon series to remind all of us, what, why does this matter? If we jump to Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, let's read this passage. This is Paul, and he says, And he gave the apostles, God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And here it is, verse 13, don't miss it. This is the end goal of being built up, why it matters. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Friends, why does this matter? Why do we want to build each other up? Why should we be eager for the manifestations of the Spirit of God through speaking in tongues? It is so that our faith and our knowledge of Jesus might become more mature and full. Now, friends, if that is not something we want, then C.L. Benny is probably not the church for you. If you don't want to grow in your faith and knowledge of Jesus, and you don't want that to mature and grow fuller even to the fullness of Christ, then friends, what are we doing? We need to repent of that. We need to press on. And if God so chooses to direct and even command us to earnestly pursue and desire speaking in tongues so that we might have our faith and knowledge in Christ more mature and full, friends, we should be so eager to follow this command. Why would I ever look at a brother and be critical if I find he's praying in a language that I don't understand, only to come to find out maybe he's praying for me? 
Maybe he's praying for one of my family members who's not saved. I don't know, but what, am I really going to be critical of him because I just don't understand? Am I going to be intimidated by a sister who's just singing praise to Jesus? Why on earth would I? Am I really going to be judgmental of a beloved daughter who's just giving thanks to her heavenly father? Friends, we have taken something so beautiful and we have put a label on it that is not of God. And I'm asking that we would take steps of repentance and faith to trust in God's character rather than the experience that might not be understood. I want to share my first experience ever with this gift specifically. I'm going to get pretty vulnerable here with you. Uh, But I remember it was back in college, my senior year at Wayne State, and I remember it was a Friday night, and you're going to think I'm really holy, but it was a Friday night, and I was reading my Bible, um, and uh, so it was more just because I was a nerd, but uh, um, I remember praying, I was reading Psalm 73, 25, which is my life verse, whom have I in heaven but you, and on earth there is nothing I desire besides you, and as I get done reading that passage, my heart is just worshipful. And I just feel led to pray. I close my Bible and I begin to pray. And I just feel led to pray, Spirit of God, would you fill me? Because there's nothing on earth I desire besides you. And I just want more of you, God. And in that moment, I began to pray. And there just didn't seem to be English words that could match the feeling and the emotion that I was experiencing in that moment. And as I began to pray, there seemed to be these spirit-filled syllables that just began to kind of utter out of my mouth and it felt clunky at first that felt a little strange at first and I of course I had my doubts but at the same time I was filled with faith in that moment to speak these spirit-filled syllables and in that moment I looked back and realized that that was clearly just a good gift from the father through the manifestation of God's spirit in love to build me up and I tested it and and the key was faith just to say I trust my my pride is being offended right now my intellect it seems to be I don't know what's happening is this just baby talk babble or is this truly spirit-filled syllables but in that moment I had faith and as I tested the spirits I said I can go back to those three categories was it it was prayer it was giving praise and it was giving thanks and my heart felt so warm towards Jesus giving thanks to him and his sacrifice on the cross I felt so near and loved and seen by the father And I can tell you right now that no other spirit in the world would do that and fill me with that other than the Holy Spirit. Not even my own spirit. So I had full confidence in faith. And as I tested it, I knew that I was speaking in a language I didn't understand. But I understood where it was coming from. More specifically, who it was coming from. And that's the key right there. Their faith, not in the experience, but faith in the one giving the gift. Amen? And I admit, I don't always understand, again, the higher ways of God. I don't know why God has designed this particular gift that I would need to speak in another language I don't understand and therefore act for an, ask for an interpretation. I don't understand that. All I know is that is what it says. That's what he says to do. And friends, that's just the way he has given and designed this beautiful gift. Now, do I understand all the ways of God? Absolutely not. I hope that no one in here would say that they do because they'd be lying. <laughs> so would we be eager for these manifestations? Because like I said, I don't know why this particular gift is designed that way. But that's what it says. And if I had to guess, in my humble opinion, maybe why it's designed this way, well, I think it would be to increase our faith in him and increase his character in us. I think that this gift is probably designed in this way because what it does is it offends our minds, it offends our intellect, it offends our academic scholarship, and it offends our pride. And praise God that he is so gracious to destroy pride. Praise God that we have a God who wants us to trust him in a childlike faith. And I think this gift is designed that way to do that. I think it keeps us at a childlike faith, desperate, humble, saying, God, I don't understand your ways, but I trust you. And if that's the end goal, that we're going to trust God more because of this gift, praise God, church. 
And I know this gift can sound wild on paper. I, but you know what sounds even wilder? That the God who created us would wrap himself in human flesh, come to earth in the form of a Jewish carpenter from a miraculous conception and a virgin birth, who would walk the earth for some 30 years without sin, not one sinful thought ever entered his mind, never sinned, and then would go to a cross to be nailed for sinners to destroy spiritual strongholds so that we could have eternal life if we would simply trust him. And that same message and that same movement has been going for some 2,000 years still. Friends, really? We believe that we bank our eternal hope on a God whom we have never seen, and yet we're, we don't think he can give us a language to speak in to talk to him. Friends, where is our faith? Where is our faith? Church, would we repent and joyfully follow this command to believe that the same God who can save us for all eternity is the same God who can give us a language to commune with him in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Amen? This goes into the last question of answering how now. How are we to earnestly pursue and practice this beautiful gift? Well, let's stay in 1 Corinthians 14, and we'll look at verse 13. It says, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. So right off the bat, we've seen this verse. We are told that any time we ask for the gift of tongues and languages, that we would ask immediately for an interpretation because we don't understand it. So that is the key right there, that we ask for the gift of languages. And if we get the gift, that we would ask for an interpretation. If we jump ahead to verse 27 in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three. And in each turn, let someone interpret. So we see that we're to pray for interpretations. We see that we're given small group settings and even private prayer settings. If we know anything about the church of Corinth, it would have been set up more like house churches. So smaller groups would have been their setting. And it gives us a great model. Paul is talking and addressing to the Corinthians. He's saying, I speak in tongues more than all of you. And so Paul had the gift. He practiced it often, apparently, and he used it in private prayer. So we see the smaller settings of private prayer and smaller groups where we ask for interpretations. So let's look at those settings first. First, we understand that these are great settings because what it allows for is an inviting environment that gives us, honestly, just the safety to fail, that we can ask for the gift, we can try to see if we have the gift, and if not, it's okay. We have an environment, we are safe to fail, we have brothers and sisters around us not judging us, not, not critiquing us, just simply allowing and saying, let's see if God would be so kind to give us this gift. And we are fallible humans, and yet at the same time, we are told and commanded to walk by faith. We know in Hebrews eleven sixteen 16 says, it is impossible, impossible to please God without faith. So would we try in our private prayer life, would we try in smaller group settings by faith? Because you know that even if you fail, even if you find out God just didn't give the gift, that's okay. He was pleased by your faith. Amen. And let me uh, share an example going off of my senior year example um, where I actually, all these years later, I, I had been praying that same language, praying the same phrase over and over since then back in college. But I never knew what I was saying. All I knew is my heart was stirred for Jesus and his gospel. And all these years later, I finally was given a gift of faith and asked for an interpretation. And I'm going to share this. I was at a coffee shop up in Fremont, and I remember in that moment, I wrote down the phrase, and this is the phrase, and just buckle in, it's just, it's intra kuntra kantra. That was the phrase. And, and again, I had no idea what that was. I just knew it stirred my heart for Jesus and his gospel. And in that moment, I was, I on full confession, I typed it into Google Translate, right? <laughs> And I was just like, all right, I got to see, is this actually real? But here's the thing. 1 Corinthians 14 is clear. 
You don't need a Google interpretation. You need a God interpretation. And you are supposed to pray for it. And I didn't do any of that. So after I repented from the Google interpretation, <laughs> I felt the Spirit lead me to write it down in a journal. And all I did is I wrote it down, and I just felt like the Spirit gave me the thought, what do you see? And in that moment, I look at it, I say, intra, contra, contra. I just recognize, well, I'm no linguist, but I know there's the ura, ura, ura. That's it. And I'm like, that looks like a pattern. I don't know if that means anything. And the thought came to mind, I wonder if this is maybe some kind of Latin dialect, because I think of pictura, scriptura, right? We see the same kind of things. I, I listen on YouTube. It sounds pretty close, because I'm like, I, Latin's a dead language. There's no way I would know otherwise. Um, but with that, then I was given a gift of faith, and the Spirit put another thought in my mind. Okay, what else do you notice? I'm like, well, I notice there's in, kun, and con. Now I'm filled with faith, and I go back to Google in Translate, but I'm filled with faith, and I had prayed this time, and I felt like I was supposed to look up the different prefixes, and in, kun, and kan with the different prefixes. And as I looked up all those, here's the amazing, lovely part of the story, that in literally means, as it sounds, in, into. Kun means with, and kan as vessel, and that literally ura just means the process of becoming. So the prayer put together was literally, God come into me, God go with me, and God make me a vessel. So for years I am praying this language I don't understand. God gives me an interpretation when I pray by faith. And in that moment I realized that the Holy Spirit had been so kind to me all those years. Do we not remember in Romans where it says that we do not know how to pray as we ought? But rather the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I didn't have the words in my English language or vocabulary to pray in the way that the Holy Spirit was so kind to intercede for me. And all those years he was just praying to the Father. Father, let me fill Justin. Let me go with him. Let me make him a vessel. And how loved and cared for did I feel? I didn't feel any weirdness about that. I, I wanted to kill the thought or anyone who wanted to come up to me and say, hey, I don't think that was legitimate. Because I was filled with faith. And I was filled with looking at the scriptures and saying it was prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. And I don't know what other spirit could have given that to me. So that is a private prayer setting. Another setting that we could use is the Wednesday morning prayer group, right? This is the Wednesday morning, 6 a.m. every Wednesday, where we get together in a small group at the offices. And this is a time where we go through tacos, which is literally Thanksgiving, adoration, confession, others, and self. So this is a time where we just thank God, praise him, adore him, confess sin before him, and pray for one another and ourselves. And in this space, we have saints who have the gift of languages, and we have seen it manifest where God is in that place. And it is beautiful. It's edifying. They are free to worship and pray to God and give thanks with all of their souls with freedom. And there's freedom to fail because this is not an, a, a setting where there needs to be an interpretation. But on the flip side now, let's go to more corporate gathering where we're at now. If we were to have someone who has the gift of languages and interpretations within the corporate big setting on a Sunday morning... This would look a little different, but you're still not left out. The scriptures still address you. If we look at 1 Corinthians 14.4, it says the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. 1 Corinthians 14.28 says, but if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. That means that when we're in the corporate gathering and there's a, a, a language spoken but no interpretation... That means we're not going to bring you up here on the stage with a mic. We're actually going to invite you to freely speak them where you are in the gathering. So whether you're praying, praising, or giving thanks, you are free to do that in this gathering. However, let's remember some things here. We're also called to orderly worship. And I just want to address the hearer. Let's say you don't have the gift and you hear someone next to you who is praying, praising, or giving thanks in a language you don't understand. Would you? I would say, could we put our guard down a little bit, have love in our hearts, and say God is truly in this place. That God is just being so kind, a father giving a good gift to a beloved daughter or son, 
and I'm rejoicing rather than criticizing. On the other hand, if you have the gift, you are called to orderly worship. Therefore, be mindful of volume. (laughs) Remember, it's called speaking in tongues, not shouting in tongues. And therefore, we need to be mindful of orderly worship, right? Speaking a language, being mindful of your volume, and after all, we know that the scriptures say, you're speaking to yourself and to God. You're not speaking to the person in the far back corner of the church. You're not speaking to your next seat neighbor. You are speaking to yourself and to God. So let it be mindful and let it match volume with that. Keeping that in mind, we see the two different settings, private and small group and corporate Sunday. Wherever you are in that, this is to equip you and give you the freedom to let the Spirit use you and manifest God's love to you. And we are told also in all of this, lest you think that we just become these mindless, mushy people who let this spiritual experience take us, we are called by Paul to pray with all of our minds, right? That is the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Therefore, Paul, when he addresses the gift of speaking in languages, says very clearly that his mind didn't become a ball of Play-Doh when he did it. He was fully engaged, his mind fully active as he prayed, praised, and gave thanks to God with all of his mind. And I can testify, any time I have ever had the ability to speak in a language, my mind was fully engaged, if not more engaged than normal, as I began to think of the heavenly things of God. And I think this is one of the biggest temptations of how the enemy would love to steal, kill, and destroy faith when it comes to this gift. Because isn't it just like the enemy to pervert, to twist, and distort anything that God has made beautiful? And when it comes to languages and interpretations, his motive is no different. He would love to come in and take a beautiful, God-given, God-designed gift and distort it, twist it, and pervert it. And this can look like maybe like I was when I began to just kind of speak the spirit-filled syllables that the enemy was right on it to say, that's not legitimate. You're just talking like a baby. You're just babbling like a fool right now. But praise God, praise God that God takes what is foolish to shame the wise. Praise God what the world might look on as someone babbling like a baby, giving praise to their creator. The world and the enemy will say, that's foolish. And God says, and I use that to shame you. I use that to shame anyone who seems wiser than me. I use that to shame the crafty, wise serpent because that is my child who is praising me and giving me thanks. So we let our minds be fully engaged. We let our our prides be fully offended. And we test everything. Again, we test. Is it prayer, praise, or thanksgiving? If it's not, it's not of him. Because only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only someone in the Holy Spirit could say that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, it is exciting and fun to think about what this church could look like. Imagine if we were to pray, praise, and give thanks in the power of God's Spirit, speaking in languages. Imagine the ways we would pray for one another. If we would just lay aside pride. Imagine the ways we would have intimacy with the Father and with Jesus if we would let the Spirit take control with our minds fully engaged, thinking of the heavenly things that are pure, lovely, and worthy of praise. The nearness that we would experience is something that I think is the greatest cost of not pursuing this gift. What intimacy, what access to the Father and to Jesus are we missing out on if we simply say, well, this is weird, let's gloss over it. Church, would we pray for this gift? Would we pray if you have this gift and you've been grieving and quenching the spirit by not practicing this ability, that you would ask for a fresh fanning into flame of this beautiful gift, that you would repent and stop quenching and grieving the spirit of God who just wants you to experience the love of the Father and of the Son, to intimately know and love and worship our God. This is, is it not the point and the goal of the gospel? Jesus coming down to earth, his sinless life, 
his sin-atoning death and his sin-defeating resurrection? Were they not to remove any and all obstacles from us getting back into right relationship with God in an ongoing, eternal friendship with God? And therefore, why would we ever stifle the ways that he wants us to do that? Why would we neglect God's good design for the friendship and fellowship that he has given us so graciously and undeservingly? Is it too much to think that he would give us such a gift? And do we have all the answers? No. Of course not. Not much is said about speaking in languages and interpretation in here. But at the same time, the Bible doesn't say nothing about it. And therefore, it's in here for a reason. Would we not gloss over it and pick through like the trail mix of the things we don't do and do not want? <laughs> and here's one last exhortation. And one last encouragement. One last invitation. In Luke 11, Luke 11, 11 through 13, Jesus himself says this. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That means, friends, if you are here, Wanting deeper intimacy, specific intimacy that this specific gift allows us to have with the Father and the Son. And you ask for this gift in faith. Do you think the Father in heaven is going to give you a serpent? Or if you ask for more of him to manifest his love to you through this beautiful God-given, God-designed gift, do you think he's going to give you a scorpion? Friends, we have a good father who only knows how to give good gifts. And therefore, would we, by faith and in good courage, ask with expectancy, pursue earnestly, and desire eagerly to know the love of God through this speaking in languages and interpretations. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you love us so much that we don't earn or deserve you, that there's nothing we can do to work our way to you, but rather in our greatest need, you sent your son to destroy any obstacle from you getting glory and us getting good. And I thank you that it is the same when it comes to spiritual abilities. How much more now, not as enemies of God, but as sons, as friends with the living God who would so kindly and graciously give us good gifts so that we might know you and have more faith in you. Would you get the glory from us desiring to speak in languages and interpretations? And would we have all the more intimacy with you through these gracious gifts? We pray by faith, even right now, that people who have the desire that you would give your good gift of speaking in languages and interpretations right now. You would fan into flame those who have quenched and grieved your spirit. We pray with faith and expectancy for your glory, Lord. All for your glory. Get your due increase, Jesus, in this church. In your name. Amen.